Hello, friends. Welcome, readers, to our third live look at the History Muse. This is the stuff that caught my eye and also principally the stuff that I've been sent over the last week. So without further ado, I'm seeing everybody coming in. I'm seeing the place you're coming from. Morning in New Zealand. It is, hope you're having a lovely day. Good morning. It's 8.30 in the evening over here. Uh, good afternoon, Lockport, New York. Hello from Los Angeles, Chicago. Welcome. Welcome, friends. It's lovely to have you all here. And I'm going to kick straight off. We're going to do much as we've been doing the past two weeks. I have not got... Hello, Intrepid Freddy Cat. Hello from Texas. Um, I have not got the full articles. I've got little sections of the articles, but I've split the difference as well. I now also have it on a screen down here that's bigger because I probably should be wearing glasses, but I haven't been to the opticians um, and I'm vain. So... <laughs> There we go. I will be using big font down here and little font here. So we will do our very best and we will crack straight on by adding this to the stream. I want to, I don't want to look like that. I want to do it this way. Thank you. Um, so thanks first for people sending me the articles. That's thanks go to Anne, Yvonne, Mary, Kate and Becky. As always, I'm incredibly grateful when people take the time in their day to spot something and then to reach out to me with it. It really does make me feel very happy that people care enough to do so. So let's hop straight in. We're going to start, of course, with updates. I've then separated off from the updates into just repatriations kind of updates, then new news, and then I've got a couple of events and exhibitions, the last of which is going to be a bit of shameless self-promotion. So that should be exciting. But we have a lot to cover and I still haven't done it yet. So let's crack on. This is from last week, uh, an update on that. I was sent a further article because the first article I was sent or I saw was a series of pictures essentially behind the scenes. This is some more of those pictures, but it's also some further explanation of what's been going on. Um, so I do recommend checking out this article. As with all of the articles, it's going to be linked in the Opera Pinboard. I will update the description box when we finish this live. And uh, it will, all of them will be on there. And additionally, in the description box, there will be a numbered list of the articles that we have looked at. So without further ado, this is the new house that's opened in at Pompeii. They have restored it. And we have some amazing information about what's inside from the pictures and also who owned it. So it's just it's just incredible. I mean, what an amazing thing. So this house was consumed by the volcanic ash when Vesuvius erupted. But it's now been uncovered and also refurbished. And it does just look like it's fairly incredible. We hear that the unveiling of the restored home is yet another size sign of the rebirth of Pompeii, which followed decades of modern bureaucratic neglect, flooding and pillaging by thieves with uh, in search of artefacts to sell. So take as old as time, isn't it, really? When things people get a chance to steal something, they looks like they will. But this is now hopefully going to be a preventive measure the more things it's that like, i suppose it's kind of like broken window theory isn't it the more things are being taken care of the less people hopefully are going to misuse them so we've got another picture here and some more information i mean wow just look at that look at the mosaic floor look at the wall paintings and as this the uh, archaeological parks director said this the wall painting and the, and the details are just utterly phenomenal I mean what a treat to go and see this I mean I would love to head back out to Pompeii at some point and get a chance to have a look at this in person it looks absolutely fabulous um, and we also have information about who these individuals were and it was referenced in the headline of the previous articles but I didn't mention it and I should have the owners they believe are two men and it's thought that they were connected to and had been 
enslaved people who were later freed. It's thought that they became wealthy through the wine trade. And some people say that they are brothers, but they aren't sure if that's the case. They may have just, their commonality of name might share a commonality of potential owner. I don't know, but there's there's questions whether they are brothers or not. I'm just going to hop this comment up. Uh, in Trevi Friday Cat, you read that they have a robo dog patrolling the Pompeii site. Well, that, that sounds deeply cool, slightly terrifying. Um, do they put it away when the visitors come? I do hope so, <laughs> because that's terrifying. I can you find a way to send me a link about that? I'd be very interested for uh, next week's news updates that I can check that out. Um, is it Lucia or Lucia? Could they have been lovers? Well, it's that, that's another tale as old as time, isn't it? That they were very good friends and roommates, uh, but actually they were in a relationship. Uh, it, of, of, of course, these these things are possible. They They are two men who live together. They could be brothers. They could be friends. They could be um, in a relationship. They seem to be working in the same trade after being enslaved. So they're both in the wine trade. Um, we have another image. This is really beautiful. So this is the, this is the living room. There's a fresco of Hercules as a child, as a child, uh, looking in in manner of kind of overcoming challenges, and I. They they have pointed out that might these two individuals have recognised their own life story in some way in the figure of Hercules who overcame challenge after challenge in his life, which I think is really a beautiful suggestion that they chose to decorate their home in a way that was in part their narrative, their story, and a celebration of what they'd come from and, and thus also where they were going. <clears throat> uh, so uh, in after years in slavery the men quote then had an incredible career after that and reached the highest ranks of local society at least economically uh, judging by their upscale domus house and garden they evidently tried to show their new status through culture and through greek mythological paintings and it's all about saying we've made it and so we are part of this elite and i think that that's really interesting that they have come potentially seemingly from slavery and the aspiration is to remain part of the community and to prove oneself as, as an individual who fits in with that society. Uh, I, I would be, I, it's not the, a period that I study in depth, but I, I would be very interested to know and to know more about the lives of enslaved and formerly enslaved people in the Roman Empire. So maybe I will see if I can find a good book or article on that. We have, I'm just going to look at this big because I, I can't see it where it is. So the architect director of restoration work has called the home, quote, one of the iconic houses of Pompeii. The residence represents the Pompeian domus par excellence, not only because the fresco is of exceptional importance, but also because of its layout and architecture. It was first unearthed in the late 19th century, closed in 2002 for urgent restoration work, including the sorting out the roof, partially reopened in 2016, closed again in 2020 for the final phase of the work, which included restoration of the frescoes, the floor and the colonnades. Crazy artist lady, this is a really good point. Could saying we made it be imposing our modern ideas on the past? I mean, I think so. That's that's we we do have to be careful of that, and that's one of the reasons why I would like to read more on the lives of formerly enslaved people. I think there's potentially a desire to see in them not leaving the place that enslaved them that somehow there's a love for it, and maybe there was, uh, or an acceptance, a gratitude even. And I, I I wonder if we should be wary about that. I wonder if there is, and it's really difficult to not put modern psychological and psychiatric understanding and map it onto the past. But I do think it's really important that we are careful about that because we are talking in terms with 
an understanding that's by no means perfect, that is so far away from anything that the people that we are referring to could have even conceived of. So yeah, I do think there's an, there's an element to which we need to be cautious about pathologizing and also trying to psychologically understand because we come from a position with a language that just didn't exist then and the, the concepts didn't and we are moving straight on to repatriations well this i actually this one gives me questions i'm not gonna lie i've, I've read the article and i don't I have questions. The Met Museum of Art, their repatriation problem is only getting bigger. Ominous. <laughs> uh, despite ongoing arrangements for its return, a stone relic looted from a Nepalese shrine in the 1980s is still on display at the Met. This 11th century artefact featuring the Buddhist and Hindu god Vishnu was donated nearly 30 years ago from the personal collection of Stephen Cossack. He was a former curator in the museum's Asian department, and now his dealings are being scrutinised by academics, activists and museum officials. Apparently, this is the third thing that the Met is donating that is returning that was donated by the Cossacks. I think that's how you pronounce the name. The issue of why of what this this item is deity sculptures which is what this is they are considered living gods in nepal thus clearly not the thing that should necessarily be in a museum thompson who had advised on early nepalese repatriation efforts visited the met two weeks ago to take a closer look the museum not only has donations from the family but it has at least eight loaned to them she said of the of that Vishnu relic that currently sits in the gallery uh, gallery near an exhibition, including other Asian artefacts donated by the Cossacks through their so-called Kronos collection, which definitely sounds like it's something a supervillain would have. Um, once you know that someone is acquiring artefacts without looking too closely as a, as a source, the first thing you should do is look deeper. And here's the thing, as they rightly point out, this is the third item from this donator that's being repatriated. Let's have a look at all of it. Would would be to me a, a logical step, I would say. Um, continue. We did talk about this. This is this is part of an update. I talked about this in a one of the pre-filmed history news. Is that Nepalese officials travelled to New York for a private meeting with Met officials. We also believe they looked at the collection, potentially made some allegations, some claims, some. Uh, put points together that they needed some stuff to come back. Um, we have here the Met's repatriation policy requires countries making an official claim on an object to prove that it was looted, stolen or otherwise illegally ex exported. A museum spokesperson said the institution is, quote, committed to the responsible acquisition of archaeological art and applies rigorous provenance standards both to new acquisitions and the study of works long in its collection in an ongoing effort to learn as much as possible about ownership history. They went on to add that the museum is currently in discussion with the Nepalese government about select objects in its collection, adding that the institution, quote, looks forward to a constructed resolution and an ongoing open dialogue. Well, I can't be the only one who is wondering who is this Stephen Cossack fellow. Unfortunately, the article lets us know. And curiouser and curiouser, cried Alice. Born into wealth, Stephen Cossack started collecting Asian artefacts in the 1970s, built a trove of Indian paintings, Buddhist sculpture, Hindu icons. 86 joins the Met Museum as a research assistant. Ding-a-ling-a-ling. -a -ling quickly ascends the ranks to a few full curatorial position. That is, my friend, the benefit of being able to work for free. Family money does help you move up the ranks of heritage lickety split. Sometimes, and here's where it gets wild to me. Sometimes using his own money to acquire artworks for the museum. So 
we've got somebody who's independently wealthy who goes from being a curatorial assistant all the way up the tippy top to a few, few a full curatorial position and in the meantime he's uh he's buying uh things to go in the met dawn let me just put this out uh it shouldn't matter if the statues are living gods, they shouldn't be in boxes in foreign lands. I mean, I, I, I quite agree. I, I would say, though, that there's an, there's an added spice to it, that these are, in the same way that I, I think that there should be for repatriation of a number of things, to me, there is an added onus when those things are human remains and also things of really heightened faith-based significance. That's that's my opinion. I think all looting is bad, obviously, but I think that there is a, a particular degree of uh, filth that goes with t taking away somebody's faith or uh, familial ancestral remains. Um, I've got two, two points here. Let me see what this is saying. Ah, you're doing laundry in LA. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining. And uh, Wicked Felina, uh, I thank you for the additional context. We have slavery in Pompeii and Herculaneum was different than we understand it. People came from the far as Syria to become slaves in southern Rome. Um, they migrated to gain citizenship. They learned the language and how to operate successfully in southern Rome interesting thank you i'm going to check that stuff out so that sounds to me more like a kind of indentured servitude almost like the guild networks in london that you would take on an apprentice who essentially would be sold for seven years to a guild member to train them up and then they would get the freedom of the city uh is it something similar to that i will certainly look into it um, hopping back to Cossack, he leaves the museum in 2006, but his influence has continued. In 2016, he made a promised gift of some 100 paintings from India's Rajput courts that he said had an estimated value of between 15 million to 20 million dollars. These were celebrated in, in an exhibition that year with the accompanying publication that he helped to author. So I think very appropriately, there's a worry that this curator's expertise and financial power might have incentivized the museum to accept relics without independent research on provenance. I would say that if you've got somebody who is buying stuff for your museum, who is also curating as part of that museum, there's there's some conflict of interest there uh oh one other thing um just on the rome stuff and then we we are going to hop we're going to keep motoring through but thank you for this the context is brilliant i yes you okay uh after 10 years if you got married you gained citizenship immediately child certificates of citizenship were found on the walls of wealthy former slaves that's very very interesting i thank you so much for that Felina, that's really, really kind of you to share that knowledge. Thank you. <clears throat> Continuing on, we have the same article. We're talking about this being an increasingly challenging museum environment. <laughs> the repeated seizures and repatriations come as the institution is still recovering from the economic consequences of the pandemic, no doubt which it has estimated will create a $150 million shortfall. The museum has responded to these pressures by providing museum employees scripts to use if pressed by visitors about loose objects. So what should a docent say when asked if there are stolen artworks in the collection? They obtained a three-page handout. Quote, the Met works rigorously. There's a lot of rigour. <laughs> we hear a lot about rigour rigorous studies of provenance all the time with the rigor the met works rigorously to avoid any stolen property entering the collection and has always followed the laws in place at the time of acquisition okay the museum also continually is also continually researching the history of works in the collection 
often in collaboration with colleagues in countries around the world, and has a long track record of acting on new information as appropriate. Well, I know that the Manhattan DA is frequently the one that's forcing that to happen. It said at the start of the article, if you know that somebody who is donating stuff to your museum has previous for the stuff that they've donated needing to go back to where it came from, then look at that first. Look at that first. Some officials have decided that the antiquities market is too dicey, according to one insider source. A Met spokesman confirmed that the Near Eastern Art Department has stopped collecting from the auction market because of its reputation for illicit trafficking. And I don't think that's better. I don't think that's better because, and this is coming... Uh, Sarah, you're saying scary to think what might be in the family's private collection that hasn't been donated, and this is potentially if it's on the auction market and it's not being picked up, then potentially then it ends up in a private collection and we don't see it again. If the museum's feeling cagey about potentially buying this stuff, it could be an even worse problem. Yeah, so I don't know what the answer is on this. Well, I do, I do know what the answer is. The auction houses need investigating. Allegedly, they sue, apparently. So the auction houses need to allegedly be the focus of an investigation. Pretty big. I'm surprised the Met didn't tell them to shout, look over there, and then dash in the other direction. I mean, it worked on Drag Race, so <laughs> why not? Uh, and it, it, you're right. And when I'm I'm being I'm being tongue in cheek, it of course I I would hate to be one of the docents who got asked that question. And this is very very standard procedure. Like if something happens, certainly when we were in various institutions following the death of Majesty the Queen, we were aware there was going to potentially be questions asked, and there was stuff that we didn't know. Um, for example, when a coronation was going to be, what was going to happen here there or, or otherwise. So there was very much a line of that we were given to just repeat so that we didn't get ourselves into any trouble. And also, you know, things like with various, if people were looking to dig up dirt, you don't know who potentially could be a member of the press looking to get somebody from this institution and a docent shouldn't be representing a museum and being used as a spokesperson. But if they said something juicy enough, it it might it might well happen that that's the case, and that could be really bad for that individual, and they could lose their job over it. So that's not a good idea for them. This is small. Um, in several cases, when artifacts have been repatriated, the Met has deleted posts from their online collection. The speed of those erasures has surprised some ethics experts who describe the disappearing posts as undermining transparency and thwarting community attempts to recoup their cultural heritage. In the Vishnu Icons case, this is bad, I think, I think this is bad, the web page was removed even before the physical artefact left the museum gallery. Oh boy, oh boy. And as... The lead, the lead of the International Museum's Council's Ethics Code points out it's expected that you keep those records because it's part of the provenance. If you had it, even if it was looted, it came through your auction house, it came through your museum, you need to, you need to keep those records. Like, best believe if somebody five years ago bought a ticket for one of the exhibitions and gave you your email, you still got that on file. <laughs> You've still got that on file. Although returning loot of artifacts can sometimes be embarrassing for museums, repatriations experts said the cultural organisations have a responsibility to keep the public informed about those decisions. Deleting web entries for repatriated artworks can obscure the historical record. Officials at the Met Museum have stood by their practice of deleting online entries, saying that its policies are made alongside curators, conservators, archivists and legal counsel. However, a spokesman said employees are now looking into the possibility of keeping repatriated artworks online as other museums like the Boston MFA have. That would be the least the museum could do, said Alicia Shapati, 
director of the Nepalese Heritage Recovery Campaign. Why delete it? She asked in an interview. It looks like they don't want to take responsibility for what happened. And if I was being uncharitable, maybe honest, I can see where that might be coming from, to be honest. This is another weird one. Don't really know what's going on here. The a Van Gogh, Van Gogh, however you pronounce it, painting with a mysterious past is apparently immune from seizure. The gallery holding it claims this is the Detroit Institute of Art. And apparently they cannot be forced to relinquish control of a multi-million dollar painting, which is at the centre of a federal lawsuit because the artwork is protected by a federal law that grants immunity to foreign artwork on display in the United States. So I think this is things that come into an American gallery are then federally protected if they come from overseas, from being seized if they belong to somebody else. This piece, Les du Roman, butchering that, I'm sure, granted immunity last summer following a under a nearly 60-year-old law that governs art and other foreign items of cultural significance imported into the US. This is the latest development in the case of the Van Gogh or Van Gogh painting, which a Brazilian art collector claims went missing from, from his collection for six years until it was found on the Detroit Museum. Doesn't quite say how it went missing from his collection. The filing, we are told, adds fresh intrigue to a case that drew worldwide attention and a security guard to the museum last week after this collector had sued the art gallery in a federal court to recover this painting, which is also known as the novel reader or the reading lady. It's supposed to be worth more than $5 million. The lawsuit by Sotter, who is this individual, his art brokerage company, described an international hunt for this painting and a frantic attempt to reclaim the work. But Additionally, one mystery remains after Monday. The gallery doesn't identify, hasn't been made to identify who loaned this painting to the museum. Apparently, it just comes from a private collection in Sao Paulo, Brazil. A federal judge, though, has blocked the gallery officials from moving or hiding the painting ahead of a court hearing on Thursday. An order from U.S. District Judge George Karam Ster, 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 prevents the gallery officials from, quote, damaging, destroying, concealing, disposing, moving or substantially impairing the value of the painting. The maintenance of this lawsuit would threaten the ability of U.S. art museums to assemble world renowned exhibitions such as Van Gogh in America likely chilling the willingness, willingness of foreign lenders to lend works of art to US institutions. Hmm? Likely chilling the willingness of foreign lenders of potentially loose or stolen art? Is that what we're saying? Like its peer US art museums, the DIA, remind me of what that, how that is, the Detroit Institute of Arts. The Detroit Institute of Arts relies on loans from collectors, galleries and museums around the world to provide the visiting public with meaningful cultural and educational experiences. These exchanges benefit societies, society immeasurably. The owner who's trying to get it back claims that he bought the painting in 2017 and after paying for it, he transferred possession but not title to this unidentified third party. So wait a second, neither person is naming, not the art gallery and not the person who's trying to get the art. This is this is weird, right? Is this weird? This party absconded with the painting and plaintiff has been unaware of its whereabouts for years. Since the plaintiff purchased the painting in May 2017, plaintiff has not known the location of the painting. What? What? Then a breakthrough. The plaintiff has learned that the painting is in this gallery's possession, the Detroit Institute of Arts, uh, and it's on display as part of the museum's Van Gogh in America exhibition. This is weird, right? Why is nobody... Why is nobody naming the person who's supposed to have robbed it or at slash loaned it? 
I'm baff- I am baffled. And I was baffled when I read it. And the, now reading it out loud, I'm even more baffled than I was before. The gallery, in a statement last week, this I swear this is like on loop. The museum follows best practices before agreeing to international loans, including the research of ownership from scholarly sources, the Art Loss Register and the US Federal Re- Register. The gallery applied for immunity from the State Department in May. The application listed 27 works of art. What? And incidentally, the gallery notes that prior to submitting its application for immunity to the State Department, they received confirmation from the art loss register that the painting, the one in question, was not registered or stolen as stolen or missing. They also confirmed the painting is not listed on the FBI's national stolen art file. Well, but it, would it be if it wasn't stolen from um, North America? Um, is that a thing? So the gallery and other US cultural institutions would suffer substantial harm, apparently, if the court were to violate the Immunity from Seizure Act and order the gallery to surrender possession of the painting to plaintiff, or even if the court were to maintain the order pending hearing. So I think this is, don't do anything until we've done the hearing. This harm would not impact only the museums, but all society, which I can see if he hasn't got an appropriate claim to it, and he's just, this is just being needlessly litigious, I can see how it would be, a pro- this whole thing is weird. <laughs> this whole thing is weird. And I just hope that there's going to be some kind of update as to what's happened here. Like, is this, did he give it to his wife or a girlfriend and then they broke up and so no one's naming names? What's happening? I just, I just want to know. Just, but no, but no one knows. So we will, hopefully, we'll get an update and we'll find out. So I'm going to hop onto another part of the PowerPoint. Now we're going to move from updates and repatriations onto our new news. Here we go. Paleontologists in India have hit on an epic find: hundreds of bowling ball-sized titanosaur eggs. We have got 256 eggs and it sheds new light on the reproductive strategies of the largest known dinosaurs. You can tell they're large because their name is Titanosaur. What is this? This is... (laughs) I'm just going to pull this. Uh, It's just like when you forget to return your friend's casserole dish. Yes, I mean, I frequently just there's a went round to my mate's house, picked up their Picasso was like I'll look after it we have a little spat they don't return my calls I've got tickets for the theatre they don't bother to turn up they stand me up we have a spat and now I've got their Picasso <laughs> yeah, it's just, I don't know I don't know how the rich live but clearly from the stuff we're learning about the the things they have in their house like a full triceratops for example they don't live they don't live like us <laughs> um Titanosaur, yes, exactly. Uh, we have paleontologists digging in the Dar district of Madhya Pradesh in central India have turned up a massive and rare hatching site belonging to a colony of titanosaurs. 92 nests and 256 eggs. This is incredible. And um, the study's lead author has the, <clears throat> talked about how the research has revealed the presence of an extensive hatchery of titanosaur sauropod dinosaurs offers new insights into the conditions of nest preservation and reproductive strategies of titanosaur sauropod dinosaurs before they went extinct the group's research has found that they nested in ways close to today's birds so they laid their eggs and placed their nest in close proximity as a colony but considering the sheer size of the titanosaurs the largest known dinosaurs, and they could measure up to 100 feet in length. These intimate clutches, very eggs very close together, uh, would have precluded mindful parenting. The newborns would have principally, I think, have to have been left to fend for themselves. These closely spaced nests would not have allowed them to visit the nests to manoeuvre and incubate the eggs 
or to feed the hatchlings because they're just so tightly close together and these things are bloody enormous. The parents would step on the eggs and trample them. So I think like a foot is the size of the nest, so you can't be like looking after it. Much like birds too, these eggs were likely laid sequentially. Evidence lies in the discovery of malformed eggs, which exhibited a phenomenon known as ovum in ovu, whereas where an egg is embedded into another egg. This is the first report of egg in egg pathology in reptiles, including dinosaurs. So six new species of titanosaurs were also recorded, building upon the three titanosaur taxonomies. Say that three times fast already identified from fossils at the Lametta Formation. To shed further light on the early lives of titanosaurs, the team plans to scan the surviving ed eggs with 3D computed tomology, quote, to see whether any of them preserve embryonic skeletons. I really hope that we aren't going to get Jurassic Park. <laughs> but that is, that is cool. That is cool. Uh, yes, they would be stomped on. I was trying to get so that that just jumped for me. Uh, we have got so called a big baby nursery. Yes, a big baby, a big stampy baby nursery. <laughs> and we have got a 10,500 year old civilization that's been found showing a rare glimpse at prehistoric survival. They have been uncovering this ancient settlement with a, this is a, a pile of finds they found. This is University of Chester and the University of Manchester have unearthed the remnants of an ancient civilization that was inhabited by hunter-gatherers. And we are told it's so rare to find material this old in such good condition. The Mesolithic in Britain was before the introduction of pottery or metals. So finding organic remains like bone, antler and wood, which are usually not preserved, particularly if soil is very acidic, are incredibly important in helping us to reconstruct people's lives. And there is something I want to talk, I'm going to talk about as an article later in a, in a few minutes that's also about the survival of fabric. So there seems to be a bit of a, a boon happening in fabric survival. Archaeologists said they found a variety of artefacts, including the bones of animals that were hunted, handmade tools and weapons and traces of woodworking, which we are told is a very rare find. And this has revealed previously misunderstood aspects of prehistoric life. And they give an example. The fossils discovered at the site indicate that humans were hunting a range of animals in various habitats, including elk and deer. The way the animals were butchered and deposited around the settlement also demonstrates that certain rituals existed within the civilization. These aren't people that were struggling to survive. They were people confident in their understanding of this landscape and of the behaviours and habitats of different animal species that lived there. Now the team, so it's going to be more, more studies happening, um, now the team hopes that a continued analysis and research at the site reveal more about prehistoric life, especially the relationship ancient humans had with the environment. Uh, where is this site? It, I'm assuming, as it's the University of Manchester, it is near to Manchester. I couldn't find, or maybe I missed it in the article, I couldn't find them naming a location. And sometimes they don't because they are worried, particularly if there's a lot to excavate, that site robbers might try and get in there first. So I'm assuming near Manchester, as that's the university that is dealing with it, but I am happy to be mistaken on that. And Marianne, are you referring are you talking about the fabric I was talking about from the Galloway hoard? No, that's not what I'm going to talk about. Was there news about the Galloway hoard that I've missed this this week? If so, could you please uh, chuck that my way somehow. That would be lovely. I haven't seen that news. If it's made the news this week, I've missed it. So I don't like it when that happens. Homebody, thank you. I'm glad you enjoy the channel and welcome to your very first live stream. Uh, it's good to have you. And I hope you enjoy. And we are talking about some mysterious Iron Age passages, which 
sounded saucy than I meant it to. Lasers are mapping Scotland's mysterious Iron Age, pa Age passages. That right there is a really cool photo. Just a really cool photo uh, of the of I think the lasers that work. Isn't it fabulous? That kind of green yellow light. I love it. So what we have here is a group of archaeologists looking down this underground passage known as a souterrain, how I believe it's to be pronounced. There are 500 of these Iron Age structures scattered throughout the Scottish Highlands and uh, <laughs> sacred tunnels is pretty much how I felt when I saw the headline. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. Um, and Intrepid Freddy Cat, yes, I've just seen your email pop up about the Robo Dog. Thank you. That will make its way into next week's next week's news. So they are looking at this Sioux terrain, 500 of these Iron Age structures scattered throughout the Scottish Highlands, but nobody knows what they're built for and no one's ever found one intact. Suggestions include they might have been used for storage, such as grain sealed in pots, dairy products like cheese. Perhaps they were for security, for keeping valuables safe. For or even for holding people like a prison, like it may have been for slaves or hostages, maybe ceremonial purposes. A lot of times we don't understand what something is from the past, ceremonial purposes, for household rituals, perhaps a medieval shrine or a private chapel. <laughs> that would have been a lot of cheese. I'm reminded of Samuel Pepys bearing his parmesan at the time of the of the Great Fire of London. Uh, Hadrian Ryan, cheese is valuable. Could not agree more. Could not agree more. And so, and Samuel Pepys is wrong about a lot of things, but bearing the parmesan <laughs> was clearly him doing some logical stuff. What's also cool is in terms of this mapping. Link, the linked article has also a link to the 3D cloud point cloud visual of what they've mapped so far. So, site surveys can help shed light on the condition and structure of these sioux terrains. They can also uh, they can also take ages. We're told they can take a week using traditional methods, but with the laser scanners, they can, this is really speeding things up. They can connect to an external laptop, but unfortunately, we still we still have a ways to go because this data can only be recorded as fast as the connection, and it's done over an Ethernet cable, relatively fast. But even then, the first laptops I used with a scanner had two gigabytes of RAM. That was the top range, and a laptop cost an awful lot of money in those days. So already from the time when they first started doing these surveys, the improvement in technology has meant that they can work better faster stronger uh, and i do recommend checking out that video i'm not sure if i can ever show videos on here um because it was pretty cool so it's all linked see if you can so do check it out and one more we have crackney is very remote it's a long way from established walking routes and it's um, difficult to access. That means it's poorly suited to guided tours or educational panels. But a 3D model can be viewed from anywhere. So that is what, what this is, this video here. Uh, you can even print out a scale model and display it in the museum. The technology is making Britain's cultural heritage more accessible and might one day help archaeologists like Ritchie solve the museum the mystery of scotland's souterrains that's so cool we've got another mapping going on we have a project to map dorset's sunken hollowways this is another laser survey being carried out along shoots lane holloway near bridport as part of the project and this is some really cool pictures here. Look at that. Look at those carvings that are on in the, they're carved into the banks of these hollow ways. Often described as sunken lanes, a hollow way is a road, a lane, track or path with tall banks that tower over the sides with tree canopies closing over the top. They are really dark, quite dark, mysterious places. Some are at least 10 metres deep into the ground 
and are formed by the movement of people, animals and carts along routes with soft ground. The English name Holloway or Hollow Way derives from the Old English hollow egg, meaning a sunken road. And there's a 3D visualisation. Oh, wow, look at that. The initial project will be completed by the end of March and a report of the findings will be published through Natural England. When that is released, I will certainly be keeping my eye out for it to see what we can learn. Nobody knows the full extent of them, these hollowways right now across the UK. So they're trying to collect and create this map. The Holloways project is inviting people to share pictures and details of their local paths via Twitter using hashtag sunken lanes. So if anybody is listening from the UK, or I, I suppose, are there these sunken pathways elsewhere? And if so, what do they look like? So do hashtag sunken lanes help to con contribute to the knowledge? What's How do researchers tell, know the difference between a ritual and something learned in the culture? That's a that's a very good question. And they are frequently reassessing that sort of stuff. I think it was those owl carvings that we had a few weeks ago that were thought to be ritual in significance. Uh, and then they have recently been reassessed and potentially reevaluated as potentially being children's toys. So more information comes out, other context things. And uh, I'm going to pull, pull this card up because you're, I'm not going to say it out loud, but I mean, I have, I have heard other people say that I'm not an archaeologist and I will never knock the profession, but I, I think that things can have ritual significance as a potentially, but it might need other evidence to find out whether it's ritual or indeed something else. Um, something about the Oregon Trail? Like this place on the Oregon Trail where you can still see the wagon tracks. I, yeah, I'm guessing, yes. Is there any, is there any carving en route? I wonder if those kind of carvings are about directions or about you know this warnings even that potentially do some of them mean there's a there's going to be a flood this is a flood plain be careful or highwaymen lurk these ways uh in germany in the kaiserstuhl area there are also sunken lanes well i wonder if they would like to see pictures as part of it maybe i think if they're asking for it then chuck up your, your your sunken lanes. The joke is that the standard go-to explanation for archaeology is religion. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but uh, we all do shorthand stuff all of the time. We all do shorthand stuff like that. And um, sometimes, and, and they're not saying it's definitely ritual. They are, they are saying that they... Are they have questions and a potential is ritual. Uh, and as you rightly say, Marianne, rituals are not necessarily only religious practices. There are plenty of irreligious and a religious rituals that take place for various parts of our lives and the ceremonies of coming of age, etc. That we that don't necessarily have a religious connotation. The German sunken lanes are called Hollweg. If I've pronounced that wrong, I apologise. So basically the same as Holloway. Well, that feels connected and interesting. Fabulous. Um, right, we're hopping away from Holloways and we are going to ancient Egypt next. And we are going to talk about tw 10 mummified crocodiles that have been found in an Egyptian tomb. And... As I said, I don't I don't show human remains, but I, I have decided to show the crocodile remains. Look at them there. Um, Denise, a lot of the carvings on the Oregon Trail is the equivalent to I was here. And I think there's a lot of carvings in various historic sites that probably have a very similar thing. They are about messaging 
to people that come after you. And I think that that's, I would be very surprised if that's not exactly what's happening in the hollow ways that we are seeing there. At first glance, you might think you're looking at a picture of living crocodiles moving through the mud, but these are mummies, possibly dead for more than 2,500 years and, preser and preserved in a ritual that likely honoured Sobek, a fertility deity who was worshipped in ancient Egypt. They are 10 adult crocodiles, likely from two different species, and they were unearthed recently from a tomb at Kubat al Hawa on the west bank of the Nile River. And the discovery was detailed in a journal that came out last Wednesday. The crocodile has played an important role in Egyptian culture for thousands of years. It's linked to a deity, it was a food source, and parts of the animal, like its fat, were used in medicine to treat body pains and even stiffness and balding. <clears throat> but in terms of the mummification practices, a lack of resin indicated that the crocodiles were probably mummified by being buried in the hot sandy soil, where they dried out naturally before being entombed, which they think researchers think happened before the Ptolemaic period. And that period lasted between 332 BCE and 300 and 30, sorry, CE. From the Ptolemaic period onwards, they are using huge quantities of resin. So because this isn't being used in these, the assumption is that these therefore are before that. The discovery of these mummies offers us new insights into ancient Egyptian religion and the treatment of these animals as an offering. The discoveries are being viewed as an important window into the relationship between the people and the necropolis, with from the first burials from 4,000 years ago right up to the present day. And then, quote, within the community, how are these tombs viewed? What were their uses? You're seeing how these tombs had afterlives and lives. So, again, it's one of those things, the more you find, the more that you understand and the more, yes, we do have... We do have the ritual word again. I think that when it comes to comes to burial and when it comes to things being buried in pharaonic or necropolis settings, I think ritual is a, is a fair take. It's a, I think it's a fair old take. There's something potentially ritualistic going on there. Whether or not it's religious, burial isn't always religious, but I think ritualistic might connect in that way. Um, we're having a debate over whether crocodile tastes of chicken or not. I cannot comment. I have never eaten it. Although if the option were there, I probably would give it a go. We're staying with Egypt. We have found, oh, this has been shared with me on TikTok as well. Archaeologists have discovered 16 metres of papyrus containing spells from the Book of the Dead. This is from people working at Egypt's Saqqara region. This is the first time a complete papyrus like this has been found in over a century. Saqqara is a vast necropolis in the ancient Egyptian capital of Memphis and this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's home to a dozen pyramids, animal burial sites and Coptic Christian monasteries. We're told that they initially believed that this scroll only measured nine metres but having restored it, translated it, it's became clear that it actually measured 16 metres. Can you imagine thinking you've got nine? Nine is amazing, but pff, wow. The papyrus, which contains texts from the Pharaonic Book of the Dead. Oh, it's also worth pointing out that this papyrus is the first one ever to be discovered by an Egyptian. And it's also named after the Egyptian that found it. It was... This papyrus contains text from the Pharaonic Book of the Dead, discovered inside one of 250 caskets at the site. The Book of the Dead is a funerary text from ancient Egypt that contains declarations and spells to aid the deceased into their afterlife. It dates back to 50 BCE. Waziri added that the papyrus, which will be presented at the opening of the Grand Egyptian Museum, is currently being translated from hierarchical to hieroglyphs to Arabic. The discovery of a 16-metre-long papyrus containing the Book of the Dead spells could shed new light on ancient Egyptian beliefs about the transition to another realm. So this is going on display 
and uh, very, very exciting. And we, I, I mean, we are having some, I don't think the Book of the Dead wakes the mummy, does it? I mean, I don't know enough about the Book of the Dead. I think, I think we're safe. I mean, it's already, maybe it makes things better. You never know. <laughs> you never know. Uh, and Papyrus lasts so long. Hooray for deserts. I mean, I, I the fact that there is barely any moisture, I would imagine is very, very helpful. And I also agree to, yay to it being found by an Egyptian. It's, I think it's really important that sites and the, their finds are discussed and cared for by the people who connect to that culture. It'll be a while since I'm trans translating to English. They're working on Arabic translation. Uh, fair enough. I will, I will wait patiently to find out what it says. Oh, sorry. Yes, the article did give the name. I shouldn't clip it. So it's it the person who found it is uh waziri um so i just i i clipped that bit out because i wanted to inc make sure that i included this picture how do roman egyptians integrate the book of the dead into their beliefs i do not know if anybody does know let please do share in the comments. I, If I miss it and don't put it up on screen, I'm sure you can still see it. I am going to hop on to the next. We are leaving. We are leaving Egypt. We have the Book of the Dead is, is a frequently asked, asked question about the Egyptian afterlife. Hi, Sarah. Thank you. Right. We're going to hop out of Egypt and we are going to go to Nazca. Over 100 new Nazca lines discovered in Peru designed by ancient people. Now, my understanding of Nazca lines is they are large scale cutaways in the soil that can be seen to us in an aerial setting. They are massive, huge things. Uh, the closest thing I can think of, I think to it that we have over here is we have uh, drawings or carvings on the sides of hills. We have one down in Dorset, near to Dorset, with a man with a large phallus <laughs> that I have talked about on here. So uh, similar, but I haven't seen a phallus in relation to this. This, though, a team of Peruvian and Japanese researchers have discovered 100, <clears throat> sorry, 168 new geoglyphs, and that's what they're called, these large-scale drawings, in the ancient Nazca plain in Peru. So this is pre-Columbian Peru, found during two years of aerial surveys, and the discovery has led to a, the creation of a new archaeological park to protect them. These, it says here, they are enormous depictions of human and animals carved into the ground of a flat plain by ancient people. So the one we have over here are carved into hills. This is on flat plains, so it is slightly different. And they, the originals measure hundreds of yards, but the new discoveries are smaller. The new geoglyphs average between two and six metres, which is 6.56 to 19.7 feet in length. They're made by removing the black stone of the plain to uncover its white stone below and a series of lines and ancient trails and as with a previous episode we have got this video um pre a previous news item there's a video of what they found which is of course linked so they've been working on this area since 2004 by 2018 they'd found 190 geoglyphs collecting images from aerial surveys and drones uh, which together with this latest batch makes for a total of 358 previously unknown geoglyphs discovered by this Japanese Peruvian team, believed to have been carved between 100 BCE and 200 CE. They depict humans, camelids such as llamas, alpacas and guanacos. I don't know what that is. There's birds, orcas, felines, snakes, and at times we're told it can look almost childish. 
Their purpose, as well as their larger cousins, which make up the UNESCO World Heritage Site, is unknown. So I'm just going to hop back to the... T so this is... They have overdrawn to see... I love the, like, surprised face of the one on the right. I think it's beautiful. Um, and they're... Do check out the video because there's more There's more on show. Um, Manda, Manda, my goodness... YouTube didn't tell me that there was a stream. Look, I I don't know what's going on. I've had so many people since the start of January come onto my pre-recorded videos and say, where have you been? I haven't seen you for weeks. And I have been doing the same thing. Uh, and I just, I and people tell me that they've been unsubscribed, that if they are still subscribed, that they have previously clicked the bell, the bell has been unclicked. I, I don't know. Apparently, Guadalcoves, I'm being told a lot, are same similar to alpacas so they are drawn all over <laughs> um and yeah there's some stuff there's some stuff going on there was some stuff going on with view numbers uh throughout december some weird stuff was happening with with the algorithm i'm very glad that you found me now and that you are all here and just right now please do make sure that you are subscribed if you think you are if you aren't subscribed yet now is a great time to do it also, the algorithm does really like it if you like, interact, do emojis, um, all of that sort of stuff. And um, let's click on all of the things that we need to do. Seeing people saying they've been unsubscribed. It's almost like YouTube doesn't want people to watch it. I mean, I did think that maybe they'd gone off me because I was posting really long pre-recorded videos so that's one of the reasons for going live and doing this and also for making my Friday videos I'm trying to keep them under half an hour and that does seem to be improving things because over December so November to December my videos were getting up there to like towards 40 minutes over 40 minutes long and I do think that that potentially might have been uh, uh, an issue so I'm I'm trying things out to see what might work better. Uh, emojis don't. I, I do. I'm. Do you know what? I mean, social glyphs. If these are geoglyphs, put up your social glyphs. Put your llamas. Put your llamas in the way. What's this? YouTube says your videos are. YouTube says my videos are for kids. I deliberately clip saying that my videos are not for kids because I am despite having a child, occasionally not child-friendly. <laughs> um, I also like doing the longer videos, but um, I want my videos to be watched, and they weren't being. They were They were really not being found by anybody. So I'm going to – maybe I'll – I'll do a few short form ones and then I can start interspersing some longer ones back in and we'll just – we'll see if we can trick the algorithm – into into doing that i would suggest the emoji i'd like to see put some llama emojis in let's do the llama alpaca emojis i saw that come up let's do some of those um would it be an option to post live stream announcements via twitter yes yes why not let's give that a, let's give that a go uh, that's really weird maybe it's because it's alive I don't know, but thank you for trying anyway, and hopefully it will let you do so again. And Patricia, thank you so much for the super sticker. Thank you. That's really kind of you. I'm very grateful to you, and thank you for being here. Thank you to everybody for being here. It's very good. I'm glad you're all here and that we are able to have this chat. So let's, enough about YouTube's it's this weird kid-friendly thing. I'm going to try and investigate that. I might see if I can call up someone at YouTube and ask what's going on there because I definitely don't say that this content is made for kids. Definitely. Um, let's hop on to my next fabric chat. We have – this is what I – the archaeologists have found exotic imports in a trash pile on Israeli Silk Road. Exquisite silks and cottons from the east and Nubia have been discovered at Nalhal Omar, a way station along a previously unknown desert highway. Look 
at that ancient fabric, 1300 years old, they think. This is the fabric I was talking about when I said about things being found. So by far the largest ever find of textiles in the period. It's This has been a project that's been going on. They've been working in collaboration with a whole bunch of institutions and they've been funded by the German state of Lower Saxony. This is a big deal, big project, and the finds are incredible. Look at it. Look at it. From the entire first millennium CE, perhaps a few hundred pieces of textile have been found. But at this site, they found about 800 or 900 pieces of fabric and radiocarbon dated them to the 7th and 8th centuries. The richness of evidence leads them to believe that this was a way station along a branch of the traditional Silk Road, Silk Route north of Israel. And there's, look at it, and then there's more. Way, yay, yay. Um, this ancient trade is passing through, it's not a new discovery, but there's a wrinkle regarding this branch of the Islamic period Silk Road. It's essentially a perpetuation of an earlier trade route that had been thought to have collapsed much earlier. From about the 3rd century BCE until the 2nd century CE, a trade route called the Incense Route connected southern Arabia with the Mediterranean at Gaza and Ashkelon. Trade along this route was believed to have collapsed during the Byzantine transition, but new evidence shows that at least this stretch of the Incense Route stayed open and in use until the 9th century, with goods making the journey like frankincense in one direction and spice in the other. And as we can see, uh, merchants were trading gorgeous silks, cottons and other fine items. We are not done with the study. Where does the silk they've come from, where does the silk they found actually come from? They still want to analyse the patterns, the weaving techniques and other features to establish the places of production, both for the raw silk thread and the fabrics themselves. The raw material may have come from China or India, but also possibly from the Mediterranean. And the production of silk, there's potentially another uh, video in this, is there was an English, one of the Stuarts, one of the Stuart kings, I want to say, tried to grow, I think it was James, tried to grow silk and he brought in mulberry trees to try and create a silk network in England. But he bought the wrong mulberry trees so the silkworms didn't eat it and make silk so that's a problem what do we burials in western china with of caucasians were in china don't don't wearing tartan don't recall how old they were that's interesting i've not heard about that that's very interesting um you sent me a DM on Twitter with a screenshot about the maid. For, thank you. I'll look into that. Very good. Thank you very much. And there are some garments preserved in Egyptian tombs. Yes. I think, though, this is about... Um, these are traded goods, potentially. So this is some of the oldest... Oldest of that kind, almost trash goods, in a way. But they're obviously not trash. And it was... Yes, Lisa, it was James. I thought so. That was where my, my brain was like, it's James. But say it's maybe James in case you're wrong. <laughs> okay, lovely. We're going to hop right on to the next piece of new news. And this is the Temple of Poseidon, an ancient temple of Poseidon found among the tsunami hit hills of Greece. The Greek god of the seas, Poseidon, they have, they have, archaeologists have discovered a temple that once stood in his honour. And it may even be those of the important shrine that's mentioned by the ancient Greek historian Strabo. They think that they have found this uh, a site that was once a Poseidon sanctuary surrounded by a grove of wild olives and that thus they believe the remains of the structure were a temple dedicated to the god. The location of this uncovered sacred site matches the details provided by Strabo in his writings. Now, I'm not going to pretend to have read those writings, but if they say so, I believe that to be the case. This, I've got, I'm going to show a picture in a minute. The nine metre, 20 foot wide temple in its heyday 
when the waves of the Ionian Sea lapped against the three hills as if it had a front row seat to the majesty of Poseidon's kingdom. The results of our investigation to date indicate that the waves of the open Ionian Sea actually washed up directly against the group of hills until the 5th millennium BCE. Thereafter, on the side facing the sea, an extensive beach barrier system developed in which several lagoons were isolated from the sea. So once upon a time, this would have been on the coastal edge. There we go. So this is the bird's eye view of the temple ruins. Amazing. Thank you very much for that super chat, Lee Taylor and Pretty Pick. Yes, this is in, indeed what I would call a beachfront property. Uh, at least it was. But I think it's the reverse of coastal erosion, isn't it? When the beach starts coming in where it wasn't before. What is that? I don't know what the opposite of erosion is. Is there an opposite of erosion? Poseidon, as we know, is the Olympian god of the seas, earthquakes, floods, drought and horses. I didn't know about horses. Among the many ancient Greek myths he features in, he is often portrayed as one of the most violent and bad-tempered. If he's annoyed, he hits the ground with his trident, causing earthquakes, storms and tsunamis. And so they think that this site was likely chosen because the area was so prone to there being tsunamis. And so perhaps they are building it in an attempt to appease this god's angry soul. But unfortunately, it does seem that it's, the temple may have fallen victim to his wrath because the evidence suggests the area was hit by a number of tsunamis at some point uh, and during most recently in the 6th and 14th centuries CE. While written accounts show how catastrophic rave, waves hit the region in both 551 and 1303 CE. We don't know when it fell into ruin but its risky location meant that it was always living life on the edge. This new study has been published in the Greek journal Kalamata. So uh, if you want to check it out, it is going to be, it's linked in the article that's linked in all of my stuff in the description box. Teresa, that's uh, incredibly grateful of you. I'm incredibly generous of you. I'm really very grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That's Wow, really kind, um, very generous. Thank you. Um, tsunamis destroying Poseidon's temple is ironic, indeed. Yes, I mean, it's more than rain on your wedding day, Alanis, isn't it? <laughs> um, we are hopping on. This is one that you can potentially help us out with. We have uh, an appeal to solve a riddle of a find at a Nescliff archaeological site. An appeal is being made to help archaeologists solve a riddle found in 2022. And I'm showing you the riddle here. They discovered unusually carved red sandstone, which has left them puzzled. And we, Intrepid Freddy Cat, has built, has popped in with what it is. The word is accretion. Accretion is a term which applies to the gradual incre increase or acquisition of the land by the action of natural forces. Fabulous. So this, we have this carving and we have the following things. The circular cup shape and the straight lines are indicative of two different types of technology, grinding and carving. We can speculate that the nest glyph, another glyph, is figurative, with the cup mark being the head. It has two long horns and two small horns, a central body line, two arms, one held up, the other down. The upward one showing possible hand holding a pipe or a weapon. Um, difficult to find Iron Age parallels, but the carving has similarities with late Bronze Age carvings of figures in horned helmets. And it's also worth noting that Nescliffe... <clears throat> lies within the putative territory of the Canovi, a name that is suggested to reference the Horned Ones. There is, a, although, of course, as we know, Vikings don't wear horned helmets. Just, just chuck, No one wears horned helmets into battle. Anyway, um, be, it, what, what do we have there? there is possibility of a connection to a horned deity at cult in the Roman army, as depicted in, at several military sites across Britain. 
because the Ness glyph was not found in a secure context, but in the backfill of a 1950s excavation trench within the guard chamber of the interned entrance, it's more difficult to identify. And we are inviting people to help us solve the puzzle or to tell us if they have seen other similar carvings. So this, if you, this is an opportunity for people with an interest in our history to get involved and help solve the mystery. Nescliffe Hillfort has been giving up interesting finds for a number of years, and it's fascinating to learn about our county's rich history, especially when it leads to a puzzle such as this. So if you have any idea about what, I'm going to show you the picture again, just to this little bad boy here, what if you have any clue about what this might be, anyone with information or knowledge to help solve this puzzle should contact either Paul Riley or Gary Locke. You can see their email addresses there. Of course, it will also be linked both in the Opera link and also in the description box. The description box will also have the Opera link, all good things like that. So if you can help them out, please do. We are hopping all the way forward to World War II. Silver-plated menorahs, tableware um, that was hidden by Jewish owners during World War II has been uncovered in a Polish home. So we have, uh, I'm assuming this is a display of what has been uncovered. It's found in central Poland, hundreds of objects that were most likely hidden by the Jewish owners of those items during World War II. They have found around 400 items, including silver-plated menorahs, hanukkahs, tableware, and other daily use items, and it was found in Lodz. It's thought the residents buried the items, hoping they would return one day, but most likely they will have lost their lives in the Holocaust. We can see the key points included in that is that they are going to be sent to an archaeology museum. I assume, though, if somebody can come forward with a claim to rightful ownership or a knowledge of, of provenance, um, Pretty Pig says, I wonder if they're how, I mean, I wonder if, if slash how they are planning on tracking them to the proper owners. I I don't know. Um, if, if this is of any use to anybody or any additional knowledge, I one one thing that we unfortunately know that the people who perpetrated this atrocity were very good at is destroying records and leaving enormous gaps. But that doesn't mean that oral tradition and family histories among rightful claimants as descendants doesn't still exist. And so for that reason, I am sharing the address that's in the article. The objects are found at 23 Pol Nocker or po Pol Nokna Street which is located just outside the perimeter of the Litzmannstadt ghetto. This, the occupying Nazi Germans established their Jewish quarter in Lodz in February 1940. Until August 1944, it held about 200,000 Jewish people from across Europe, and most died there or in concentration camps. Referring to this find, a... Uh, municipal investment administrator official said that the items in their history stir quote emotion and deep thought about the fact that we are not alone and that we leave something behind so um yes on that rather incredibly depressing note i'm going to close out the new news and hop into events and exhibitions this was shared with me in relation to a conversation we had last week about the Parthenon marbles, Parthenon sculptures, and about whether or not the British Museum can claim to have looked after them. And I pointed out that they can't really be claimed to have looked after them, considering they scrubbed off all of the colour. So let's hold on before we talk about how well they've looked after it. And this was shared with me, and I have talked about this exhibition before, um, but it's going on until March 26th. So we are approaching the last weeks to check this out. Chroma, ancient sculpture in colour. And what you can see here is clearly a very beautifully coloured object. What they are doing is um, taking ancient Greek and Roman sculpture, uh, recognising that it was this once this vibrantly painted 
image. Uh, so the Parthenon marbles would have been, et cetera, et cetera. And what they are attempting to do is put that colour back onto the artefacts, whether they are using digital technology or reproductions. So they've got a set of reconstructions of ancient sculpture in full colour alongside ancient artefacts themselves. So I... If you have, if anybody has seen this, um, then do let me know what you think you thought of it. If you're planning on going to see it, I hope you enjoy. And I think it looks fabulous. It's another one of those ones that I, if I was able to get over to the States, it's one of the ones that I would love to see. Um, Justine, you've not upset me, my darling. Um I am I am I am seeing a message coming in and I'm not ignoring you. I uh I I am trying to stick to the topic. That's all. And if you have questions for me, I am very happy to take them and maybe make them into other videos. I find it ideal that I uh, our ideal of ancient sculpture is marble white when in fact they were most kind of yes, exactly. And this is one of the reasons that when things come into collections, came into collections, particularly in the Victorian period, when they had an idea about what history looked like, uh, cleaning things up frequently <laughs> resulted in destroying patinas and really important stuff that mattered. Um, Lisa has seen photos of the chroma exhibit, very, very bright and busy colours. And this is the thing. The past is a riot of colour. I often say when I'm when I'm talking to people about Hampton Court Palace and I stand them outside, I say this is what, broadly speaking, what Hampton Court Palace would have like, looked like as the Tudors knew it, except it's not because it would have been colour on top of colour on top of colour both the walls of the exterior and then in the tiles on the floor, the ceiling paintings, the tapestries, it's just almost, I think, offensively bright. Um, and everybody, is, if they can be, is dressed in really rich, shimmering colours. Even the black velvet and damasks would have maybe cloth of silver shot through them. It's it's a riot of colour, the whole, the whole place. Uh, yes, ancients love colour. There's a lovely video of British heritage about Roman makeup and how women wore eyeshadow in vibrant colours. Yes. Um, ancient people liked colour no less than we do now. I mean, if anything they probably liked it more. I think, uh, and I mean, I'm ancient all the way through to early modern. For example, if we think about uh, Tudor buildings and we, we have this very clear idea about what Tudor looks like, it's that sort of whitewashed wall and we see the wood in between. And we love, 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 love natural wood. The Tudors would have tried to make that look like marble or or some other kind of stone the whitewashing would have been painted with really vibrant colors patterns motifs if anything we like our world potentially a bit blander than they did um so yes i i think as much if not more our Final topic. This is my shameless bit of self-promotion. I'm going to just do it. So, friends, if you are about on the evening for me of Thursday, the 9th of February, it says Hyde Park, but it's not Hyde Park. It's online. This is part of the anniversary of the 150th anniversary of Speaker's Corner. Very famous place. And it's in collaboration with my very dear friends at Zoom Through History. And they have... I am over the moon today, invited me to come and do some historic interpretation. And this is who I'm going to be. I will be taking on the role of Christabel Pankhurst. So I will be discussing the role of Speaker's Corner uh, and her connection to Speaker's Corner. And it will be online, 9th of February, two. And that is 
between 6.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. And that is GMT. So I will be in my vote swimming sash being Christabel Pankhurst. And I'm really looking forward to it. So tickets are available. It's the stuff will be linked. I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to update my description box, get that all linked up and uh, we will be good to go. So I will, I will link everything down below. Uh, that's me done for today. I will, of course, be uploading a pre-recorded video on Friday with, and it'll be premiering. So I'll be in the comments to chat with you all. That'll be going up and going live at 4 p.m. GMT. Hope to see lots and lots of you people out. Uh, Jared says, I'm glad you photoshopped the knife out. Don't tell anybody. It wasn't there. And no one can prove it. <laughs> um, uh, well, Lisa, I'm not, I'm going to be inside. So the, it's all online and I will be broadcasting not from speaker's corner it's about speaker's corner but i won't be there uh, which is probably a good thing as it's liable to be blinking cold and thank you again for i see that crazy ash lady i will check my inbox thank you again for sharing the news articles with me this last week please keep doing so i do love it uh i love seeing what you share with me and i love doing these lives and i hope you all do too we have 151 of you in right now according to my video thank you thank you so much for joining in thank you for sticking around for commenting for posting emojis for, for liking for hopefully subscribing uh if you think you have if you have pals you think would enjoy this sort of a thing do let them know don't come on down and we can all have some more fun together and build the community and get more chats going on because i love how when i don't know something I can just throw it out and you will let me know the answer. I really appreciate how intelligent you all are and how knowledgeable you all are. And it's just really, really great to have you all here. And I'm incredibly happy that you found me and that I found you. And I think that's a perfect way to end it. I'm off to value to bury my valuable cheese. Well, I'm going to say good luck with your with your valuable cheese. And as you are correct, correct as well. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, social glyphs is our word for emojis. Social glyphs all over the place. Uh, eat your cheese. Don't bury it. And I will look forward to speaking to you all in the premiere on Friday and also in a live again on Monday all things being okay. I will see you same time, same place next week as well. But whatever you are doing, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Or if you've got more of your Monday left, a wonderful rest of your Monday. And I do look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. But for now, do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.